Hello there. I'm Professor Becky Francis, Chief Executive of the Education Endowment Foundation. Welcome to you all. And I want to congratulate all teachers and senior leaders present on all you've been doing to support your pupils' learning in spite of the huge hurdles presented by the COVID pandemic. I recognise the enormous efforts that you've been going to to support your pupils, their families, and often your colleagues at this really challenging time. And I also want to congratulate you for making the time to attend today. It's really vital that we learn from one another in this critical period. Now, this is a schools-led delivery by Oak National Academy and various schools from across the country. The Education Endowment Foundation is an organisation that generates and mobilises robust research evidence to support effective practice. And in the spring, we conducted a rapid evidence review on effective remote learning. You can find that on our website, as you'll imagine, it's proved enormously popular. The evidence on successful remote instruction is actually quite limited. Uh, much of the research in this area previously has been in other sectors, such as higher education, not schooling, and it hasn't necessarily always uh, rigorously compared different approaches. But we do have some evidence on what best practice might look like. The first key message is that high quality teaching remains the most important element and trumps the vehicle of delivery, actually. Um, the principles of effective teaching remain the same online, so high quality instruction, high quality assessment and feedback, modelling and scaffolding, and building on prior learning and so on. The evidence also suggests that it's important to support pupils with the skills to learn independently to allow scope for teacher to pupil and pupil to pupil engagement, that was a really important message from the research literature, and to focus on supporting staff to implement approaches successfully. Um, that's CPD and development of, of teachers to be able to thoughtfully conduct remote learning, learn from one another, um, but also from the existing evidence is really important. And of course, effective digital provision relies on access to technology, which we know to remain unequal at present. So all of this presents really significant challenges. We need to avoid increasing teacher workload and to attend to teacher and pupil mental health and well-being during the intervening period as well. And so this session really seeks to support in all these regards. We shouldn't need to reinvent wheels unnecessarily. We can share learning and resources, and there's the opportunity to draw on pre-recorded, ready-made quality resources, such as those provided by Oak Academy and BBC Bite Size and so on. And that frees up teachers to focus on the important elements of teaching and learning. Looking to the future, it's going to be really important to address the issues around learning loss and thinking how we can take steps to close what's been a growing attainment gap uh, for social disadvantage um, compounded by the, the, the circumstances of the pandemic. We're going to need a sustained approach that addresses short-term but also medium and long-term solutions. And I'm very proud of the role that the Education Endowment Foundation has taken in supporting the provision through the National Tutoring Programme and the Nuffield Early Language Intervention, again, focused on addressing the needs of disadvantaged pupils in bespoke ways to address learning loss uh, during the pandemic. But we're gonna need to work collectively as a sector on what's going to be a profound and long lasting challenge. So the sessions today are going to focus on a strong remote education strategy, delivering the curriculum virtually, and maintaining motivation and well-being and safety. And I hope you find it valuable. 
And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Mark Alday, who's senior leader at one of our brilliant EEF research schools, Sandringham School, who's going to kick us off with a session on getting the basics right. Mark, over to you. Hello and welcome to this session entitled Remote Learning, Getting the Basics Right. My name's Mark Alday and I'm a senior leader at Sandrum School in St Albans, Hertfordshire. For this session, we've partnered with Hayden Hewish School, who like us are an EdTech Demonstrator School, part of the DfE's EdTech Demonstrator Programme. The purpose of the EdTech Demonstrator Programme is to provide peer-to-peer -peer support, support for schools looking to implement remote or digital learning strategies. It's fair to say that for all school leaders, the past 12 months have been a real challenge. Implementing remote learning at quite frankly very short notice has been a challenge for all settings. Sandringham School is a co-educational comprehensive academy, part of the Auburn Academies Trust based in Hertfordshire, with just over 1,600 students on roll and a very large sixth form. Since 2014, Sandringham has run its own Bring Your Own Device scheme, which has seen students in Key Stage 3 and 4 bringing in their own tablet devices and at Key Stage 5, laptops or Chromebooks. Our approach to the use of digital technologies, though, is one that is blended. We truly understand and believe that traditional teaching methods need to be skillfully weaved alongside the use of digital technologies to make the best choices in terms of student learning. And progress. All of what we've implemented and, and decisions that we've made at Sandrum have always been inf informed by the latest research that helps underpin our decisions. As aforementioned, today's session will focus on this report by the EEF that was published in April. Remote Learning Rapid Evidence Assessment. If you're yet to re read this report, I would highly recommend that you, you, you go and view it alongside all of the other materials that the EEF have so helpfully provided, such as different frameworks and other hints and guides in order to support school leaders and classroom teachers. The report gave five clear recommendations and each one of these five recommendations we are going to now look at in a little bit more detail and expand upon further over the next 10 to 15 minutes. So let's start with teaching quality. In your school, you will have your own teaching and learning ethos and culture. And that will need to remain when teaching in a remote setting. In fact, it's fair to say that all the research suggests that the mode of delivery is nowhere near as important as the quality of delivery in the first instance. And that's evident when we um, when we look at in-classroom teaching too. When we look at remote delivery, an emphasis on clear explanations, scaffolding and feedback have a significant impact upon student progress, engagement and outcomes. It's not without saying that within the, within the media of late, there has been quite a debate with regards to live and non-live delivery of lessons. The, the EF's findings are still that there's no clear difference in terms of um, in terms of progress or outcomes when it comes to synchronous and asynchronous delivery. And in fact, it's all about choosing the right tool for the right job, depending on the learning that needs to take place at that time. It's fair to also say that teacher workload and, and the manageability of everything that teachers are, are being asked to do can be more complex and difficult when thinking about doing so in a remote environment. I would always empower school leaders to make the best decisions uh, in order to ensure that their staff feel supported. And that may include the need to carry out some strategic abandonment of things that you may have otherwise normally done. A continuation of ensuring that you know where students' starting points are and assessing their prior learning is even more important when talking about remote teaching. How you would normally do this in, in a classroom setting is often quite simple. For example, through classroom circuits or polling students through a mode of questioning. However, we need to change that through the use of digital tools and we'll look at that in the last section of today. Finally, engagement of all stakeholders is key. 
teachers, senior leaders, parents and carers, and children themselves all need to be part of this journey and understand what the journey may look like. With this in mind, the EEF have, has um, released subsequent guidance, which, is, which looks at highly effective communication strategies. This can be found on the EEF website. Some of the resources that the EEF provides include scaffolded or, or model communications that can be sent to parents via SMS, email or other methodologies. These are very useful in terms of uh, keeping things positive with parents, but also giving them some strategies for how they can help at home. For now, we are jointly at the chalk face, teachers and parents and carers at home. And therefore, the more support, guidance and help, however small it may be, we can provide them with is going to be useful. Access will always be a barrier when it comes to remote learning. As a minimum standard for, to access most remote learning, the student will need a device and the young person will need a stable connection to the internet. It goes without saying that within many reviews, the lack of technology is said to impact disadvantaged students the most significantly if they do not have access to it. With this in mind, school leaders as a whole, as a collective, we need to ensure that no learner in our care is unable to access the provisions that we've put in place remotely. Make use of schemes such as the DfE Digital Device Scheme in order to ensure that all disadvantaged students have access to a device. It is worth noting that although schools or academy trusts are um, allocated a certain number of devices, allocations did recently change and it's worth checking your allocation on the Get Digital Devices portal. In addition to that, in exceptional circumstances, schools can um, make an application for additional devices beyond their application. Schools should also make use of additional funding streams in order to support uh, students that uh, to support students where it is a barrier to learning through the use of not having a, a device. This could come through pupil premium funding or the most recent catch up COVID catch up funding. This will not only be useful in the here and now during this period of school closure, but also when we look to return, which could involve both hybrid teaching and also making sure that we make use of, of all the resources we can to catch students up. I've already spoken uh, about the need to engage all stakeholders in my previous section. However, when it comes to using new platforms and technologies, it's important that we provide all stakeholders with the appropriate training and support that they may need in order to make use of it appropriately. By all stakeholders, that doesn't just mean teachers. Teachers will need to, to make, we will need to ensure that all teachers are confident with the platforms and tools we're expecting them to use. And there is, there is a real a range of resources out there, freely accessible, more than ever, that will enable school leaders not, not to reinvent the wheel themselves, but to make use of, of, of what's already present in order to support teachers. I've already mentioned parents. When, when using new technologies and platforms, it's important in this remote setting that parents know how they function too, what the expectation is of them and what the expectation is of their child. Throughout the country, I've seen some fantastic work engaging parents. From holding information sessions to dedicating a section of the school website purely focused on this area. You will know the mechanism that's right for your school. But I would urge you to make sure that the information to uh, to parents is almost as strong as it is to all other stakeholders, such as such as uh, children in your care and also the teachers, so that we're working collectively when it comes to supporting students learning remotely. Peer interaction is evidenced as an important means to motivate students throughout period of school closure and also improve their outcomes. 
Strategies to implement peer interaction and engagement need to be carefully planned and the right digital tools need to be chosen in relation to your setting and age group in order to make the most efficient and effective use of them. However, the EES guidance found that peer marketing and feedback, sharing models of good work and opportunities for live discussions are things that have worked particularly well in the last period of school closure and therefore remote delivery. What I would like to say as a caveat to that, though, is most of the studies surrounding peer interactions have focused on secondary age pupils. This doesn't mean that it isn't important for students younger than that, though. As aforementioned, careful planning and, and providing um, a, a plethora of tools that, that staff within your and teaching staff and support staff within your schools can use in order to enable peer interactions is really key. We'll talk about this more in the fifth section. Independence is also cited as a significant factor. Being able to empower students to work independently is really key. However, in order to do that, the tools that they must use to do this must be clearly signposted and be available to them. Once again, through the work that we have done with other schools, we have seen some fantastic mechanisms for this. For example, assemblies talking through the expectations of, of, of students, how-to guides posted on school websites or other virtual learning environments, whereby it, it breaks down um, the steps that students undertake to need to use particular tools. Emphasising the structure of what their working day may look like at home, where there may not be a normal timetable in place. Getting parents on board to understand the expectations once again would also be a vital uh, part of this. Self-reflection strategies and strategies to help students when they are stuck are, is something that no doubt we embed day to day in teaching practices across the country. However, emphasising these in a digital environment is also important. For us as teachers, it's important to make sure that we fully understand the role that metacognition, self-regulation -re and things like memory load play in terms of students being able to truly understand and master content. Again, the EF and um, uh, the EF and, and, and other institutions have carried out a wealth of research in this area and much more information on, on this particular topic can be found in further training materials or on the EF website. And thinking about key group students, such as those with special educational needs or those at a disadvantage, Within school, we would normally plan for extra support or provision um, in order to accelerate their learning and to make appropriate progress. This doesn't stop when it comes to learning in a virtual environment. And whilst it may seem, um, seem, seem harder, there are mechanisms that schools can use. For example, most recently, I've seen schools making excellent use of teaching assistant and learning support assistance, whereby they help students with, with, the, with this idea about self-reflection, self-regulation and helping them come unstuck to, to um, quickly unpick a knotty issue, um, which then builds their confidence and hopefully allows a student to move forward more independently. Again, I've seen fantastic collaboration between teachers and uh, teachers and parents, teaching assistants and parents and other support staff and parents to help them help their child at home. Don't forget other support staff. Maybe you have pastoral support staff, for example, which, again, could be a very key person to keeping students motivated. Students will still need that champion behind them, the person that, that helps to motivate them, drive them forward and have a love for learning. But it doesn't have to be people driven. Don't forget that basic support mechanisms can help individual learners with particular needs. For example, simple things like the use of a checklist that a student can go through with their parents to, um, to make sure that they're on track or understanding a task. The role of maybe a flowchart for a particular learner whereby it breaks down step by step exactly what they need to do and maybe one or two decisions that they may have to undertake and therefore providing a choice factor within the learning that they're undertaking. All of these resources will help 
not only the teacher understand maybe where a student's getting stuck, but also to help people at home, parents and carers, let their uh, to help their, their their child become unstuck. And finally, we move to different approaches. You, as a school leader, will know your school best. And therefore, you will need to determine the best approaches to undertake to support learners, make sure that, 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 that we minimise the opportunity for students to fall behind and hopefully to keep students engaged throughout a period of school closure. So within this, you will have to help develop a toolkit of tools which staff can use. Within your school, you will absolutely have your own individual personalised teaching and learning ethos and culture. That doesn't change when it comes to a virtual environment. Within your ethos and culture, you will have a toolkit of mechanisms that teachers use dip in and out of to ensure that they're using the appropriate tools for the learning outcomes that are set. This doesn't change in a, in a remote setting, but it's up to you to derive those tools uh, and empower st uh, staff to make use of those tools throughout the, the, the duration that we're working remotely. Now, as a school leader, if you're currently sitting there thinking, well, I don't know what the external, so I don't know what, what, what the tools would look like in a digital setting. You know, we're not familiar with, with, with many of these. It's time to seek external support and it's not a weakness to do so. There is a, a whole wealth of support out there at the moment. And, and namely, as I've said before, the EdTech Demonstrator Programme offering free peer-to-peer -peer support completely funded through the Department for Education, whereby another school will be able to help you. But don't forget to also use your existing networks. All schools pretty much are in the same boat at the moment, and therefore the sharing of idea and ideas and best practice is really important. We, even as an EdTech demonstrator, are learning so much from other schools, including those who, who arrive on the programme thinking they don't know much at all. The EFers, uh, in their guidance report, has stated um, some uh, some uh, things that, that are really useful or things that are impactful in a remote environment. I use the example on uh, of the fourth bullet point here, or the third bullet point, sorry. So, for example, using technology to support retrieval practice and low stakes quizzing can help to retain key ideas and knowledge. So, in principle, that sounds like a, a fine idea. And in the classroom environment, you know, we would have all of the tools within our usual uh, sort of plethora of things that we would use and, and within our planning uh, devise activities that would allow for retrieval practice or low stakes quizzing, maybe as a form of formative assessment. But if teachers are unfamiliar with digital tools for this, it is up to us as school leaders to help them understand that. And this is what I mean about, and I'm trying to exemplify now, the idea about having an idea of a, of, of a toolkit. So, for example, for low stakes quizzing, I might have a range of tools that, that teachers can dip into. For example, Kahoot, Quizlet, Quizzes. For retrieval practice, I might have... Um, some potential methods whereby teachers can can maybe make use of um, retrieval tra challenge bridge but maybe these are hosted in a digital means so for example on a google slides or something that that students hand in through microsoft teams i've already mentioned this principle that i truly believe that it, tracking engagement whilst working remotely is, is is simpler than tracking student progress by engagement has a student turned up to a live lesson? Has a student submitted their work on time? Has the parent been able to maybe um, produce the or send the work to the teacher that was due that day? And um, that that's quite simple. That that that's the, the the baseline tracking of engagement. But progress and formative summative assessment and the feedback that follows is, can arguably be more timely in a remote environment. Once again, as school leaders, it's time to review. Our, our assessment policies and ensure that they're fit for purpose during this time and once again provide teachers with guidance for how they how they can give um, feedback in a remote setting again support with that can be ascertained through many programs such as um, the the edtech demonstrator program and finally as I've mentioned already multiple times, this idea about, you know, um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Most things are out there. It's just finding them. And I understand as a school leader myself, that it can be quite frustrating trying to pull together all the resources that, 
that you may need. When it comes to significant resources, I've already mentioned many times at Tech Demonstrator, but there is also um, DFE funded resources such as the Oak National Academy that are doing a fantastic job of providing a whole range of resources that schools can use either independently or alongside their current curriculum which in, and, and the schemes of learning within that. But also with Oak National Academy, the training offer, the webinar offer that comes alongside um, the, the resources themselves. And finally, it's important for, for, for me to finish this section in saying that all I have done today is break down the EEF research. But it's up to you and as you know your settings best as senior leaders to, to, to use your professional judgment to, to determine how it is best to support pupils, teachers and parents and carers in your school to make the most impact and to avoid any gaps in knowledge or any to any advert any um any additional catch up that may need to take place after we after we return from this period of remote learning thank you hello my name is ben cobalt i'm assistant head here at hardin hewish school which is a large high performing um secondary in chippenham wiltshire so we're an EdTech demonstrator school like um, Mark's at Sandringham um, and I thought I'd give you some context as to our background with EdTech uh, for us to be an EdTech demonstrator school supporting other schools uh, along their journey. So uh, the school has long had a history actually of IT um, long before the current crisis. The school applied in 2015 and was successful to become a Microsoft showcase school and has been ever since. And that's all due to the leadership at the time of uh, Lisa Percy uh, and others within the school who led the school through a transformation, meaning that we were uh, very much ready for the crisis and remote working uh, as we're fully cloud based um, and 100 percent Microsoft Office 365 trained. Now, uh, when actually before the uh, crisis, when the EdTech Demonstrator program first came round, um, we applied for positions as we felt we had a lot to offer the programme uh, and that continued uh, with the crisis. And now we're in a position where with our uh, understanding of research, um, the good teaching and learning work that goes on at Harden Hewish um, will continue through our remote work. And we understand that through the good uh, materials that have been released by the EEF and the Research School Network. So with our background with IT, our background with teaching and learning and our background with research. We pull all three of those things together as an EdTech demonstrator school to support other schools in their journey. So in April of this year, the EEF put out their rapid evidence assessment, which gave us a great rule of thumb, a good toolkit to work with when actually reflecting on our own practice as a school with remote learning. Um, it really helped us as a school and now we're starting to use that same program when we're reflecting with others from other schools in our EdTech Demonstrator program. So uh, one of the things that we found quite quickly is it's better to begin at the basics and begin at the safest level of practice and then move through um, to the more advanced levels of practice, those that might require more training. And it's that kind of bespoke setup for each school in each context that I'm going to talk you through now. So working with each individual school um, to support them isn't the only way that we're helping the um, wider community. Uh, we're also putting out public materials uh, and most recently our EdTech um, Spring webinar series heavily focused on responsive remote teaching uh, with our first programs happening very soon. There's been a lot of interest uh, locally and nationally because the need for responsive remote teaching is clear. So. Uh, when we're starting to work with each individual EdTech demonstrator school, we use those five key pillars of practice, good practice from the EEF. But we also do this as intelligently as we can when we're working with each school, because we're trying to match what we know works in remote learning through the EEF and our own experience to the context of each individual set supported school. They vary in, in experience and vitally in the capacity um, of their teams because it varies a lot as to what's really going in on in their schools. 
Um, some, uh, their staff are confident and just need to refine and push the boundaries further, but some, their staff aren't in that position. Um, some schools have banks of iPads uh, and have been able to ensure equity of access across all of their students, but some don't. Um, some schools we support have 30 to 60 percent of their cohorts actually in the classrooms, especially in primaries, with staff balancing in school and remote learning. But in some secondaries, the teachers aren't required in. So this spectrum of need requires a tailored approach to support. And that's why the EdTech Demonstrator program is absolutely vital rather than just putting out national materials. So we've been able to work with lots of uh, of our supported schools to produce tailored materials and tailored training um, and we've had plenty of excellent feedback. Some of the training that we've produced have, has been as simple as running live training for the, for uh, staff in other schools. Uh, we've had good feedback from that and the best feedback we get is that immediate you've just saved me hours of work tonight when we show them the quicker way to do things the more efficient way to do things. But we've also produced programs of uh, materials which are asynchronous, materials that schools can talk themselves through. So you've heard enough about the support from our side of things. Let me uh, allow you to hear from one of our supported schools from across the EdTech Demonstrator network. We got in touch with uh, EdTech Demonstrator by email. Through the system, we were paired up with West Suffolk College. Uh, and it's been really successful working with Nick, who has been very supportive in getting us started. I met with Nick online um, and we talked about what was happening in the school and our remote learning and our context. Um, and we quickly established that we needed some training in G Suite uh, and really starting the basics of how we'd set up the Google Classroom. Because one of the things we realized is we needed to train the children in how the classroom works. Uh, and that was really good preparation because in the last few weeks, we've had to put some of our classes into lockdown. Um, and as a result, we've been running two lots of virtual learning. Um, and that has been so successful. We've run some surveys to compare this lockdown against the previous lockdown. And the response from parents is completely different. And now we can recognise that actually during the, the first lockdown, we did OK, but actually we could have done better. And now we are as a result. Because we've engaged with the programme, we're now confident in setting assignments online. Uh, and the other really successful thing is not just the teacher doing it. We've got the teaching assistants from the class as well. Um, and we're able to write a really tight remote learning policy around what we were planning to do as a result of the programme. If we hadn't applied to the programme, I think our remote learning would have been successful, but there would have been pockets of success across the school because uh, lots of staff are at different levels of competency. So what it was able to do was bring everybody up to the same standard and then staff were able to go and explore. Okay, next term, we fully intend to carry on uh, with G Suite and the Google Classroom. And that is if COVID is taken out of the equation, we fully intend to carry on. Because what we have discovered through the programme is it's opened our world to a completely different way of engaging with pupils. Um, and we think it's been really successful uh, and can certainly see the benefits moving forward. Having heard from the EdTech supported schools, you will have seen the fantastic impact this EdTech Demonstrator program has had in the previous few months and will continue to have over the next few months to come. But this may well now be a time when we can imagine that the plates that we're all spinning, perhaps we can look a bit further and beyond them. And there may be elements of our learning from this entire experience of school closure that we see becoming part of more everyday practice. Things from communication, how have we stayed in touch despite working at such disparate lengths? What about CPD practice? Our CPD has continued and actually some elements of this will continue to be good practice moving forwards. Things such as having recorded sessions and sessions which staff who are part time and flexible working can access. And actually, maybe it will enable more flexible working and more family life to continue. Efficient communication 
home life balance, the fantastic resources that have been produced over time and the resources nationally that have been produced that we'll be able to reference to help with our explanations, modelling and scaffolding, along with the home learning gains that we found and students have found and the time saving tools that we found working together as teams remotely. Now, the gains that we've seen in that practice will be something that a lot of us will wish to continue. And Microsoft and Google have presented many avenues for us to continue to look down. Microsoft have their remote learning hub where you can continue to access all the latest information to support students and save time and remote learning. They have their education events where you can go to see programs which are tailored to you and you can visit those programs at any time. And then there's the fantastic Microsoft Educators Centre, which has on-demand multimedia courses designed by educators for educators. And that's been something that we've used as a school widely. Google also have their own programme of similar networks from the Teach From Anywhere site, which is a hub of digestible how-to trainings, the UK webinar programme and the distance learning trainings and resources on the Teacher Centre. We look forward to continuing to support schools across the country and we're thankful for the support that we've received throughout our experience from the EdTech Demonstrator Network. As we all continue to look towards the future, what we do know is that working together, there's a very good chance we're going to come back better. Hi, I'm Jenny Hickey and I am Deputy Head and Year 6 teacher at Danesfield School. As a profession, we should regard remote learning as a unique opportunity to empower our learners with skills that they can take with them into the future. With this in mind, we can use this period of remote learning as an amazing opportunity to develop independence in our children. As with making any positive change, teamwork is so important and including the whole school team in planning, executing and reviewing is vital. In my experience, some traditional practice in schools can reduce children's learning independence and in turn can lead to problems in further education. Remote learning is a great opportunity to develop independent skills and the complexity of the situation we are in has certainly helped our children have to take risks and develop their own resilience. Delivering lessons remotely has many positives that the profession can learn from as we move into the modern era of teaching and has forced teachers to think of innovative ways to use technology to enhance their practice rather than to use it as an imitation tool for what they always used to do. The opportunities for creativity are endless, whether it is to take your children to a virtual world where they can experience the trenches of World War One whether it is simply to try your hand at a bit of guided reading karaoke, the treasure trove of resources at our fingertips is incredible. This is definitely something that has shaped the way I look at teaching lessons and want to continue to do so when we are back face to face teaching. Live streaming lessons to those at home and in schools is crucial to being able to teach meaningful content and set ambitious work, resulting in children who are engaged. Using technology in this way allows our learners to collaborate, ask questions and problem solve in ways they would if they were in the classroom. We share our screens with the children to model learning, as well as recording the live lessons so that any children who have missed the lesson for whatever reason or just finding the work challenging, can access the lesson again to support their learning. One of the ways we try to ensure a strong level of engagement and communication is through frequent feedback. As a school, we provide whole class feedback on daily live lessons, in addition to more personalised feedback on children's work. This positive reinforcement encourages the children to challenge themselves and maintain high expectations of the work they are producing. Although not a replacement for the importance of face-to-face -face interaction, the ease of seeing exactly what needs to change and having instant access to this knowledge makes editing their work less overwhelming. The increased opportunity for independence and collaboration in a unique way are avenues that we must keep in mind even when schools return. 
The lessons that we as teachers have learned from remote learning should shape us and encourage us to take the positives so that we don't return to school as the same people we were when we left. Technology is forever developing and if there is one thing for sure, it is that we should embrace the change and be less afraid of replacing old practice for new. We should strive to bring the positives that we have learned from remote learning into our face-to-face -face classrooms when we return. Hello, I'm Sarah Morgan, the head teacher of Danesfield Primary School, discussing how to support teacher workload. This is an important topic because we need to create inspiring opportunities for our teachers to enable them to provide engaging and exciting lessons, helping them to be creative in their planning and have the opportunity to continue to do the job that they love. Firstly, one of the most important tasks is to provide an opportunity to reduce lower impact work for the teachers. Review the daily and weekly tasks that we ask of teachers and ensure they still have a significant impact. If the answer is no, remove them. Next, ensure everyone is aware of the homeschool agreement and remote education and hybrid learning and set the expectations for how parents and children can communicate with teachers. Ensure the teachers feel supported with a new way of working. Communicate the expectations of marking with your community so staff don't feel overwhelmed with responding to work. Story time, circle time calls at the end of the day enable staff to ensure the children and teachers come offline and manage expectations. This prevents children continuing with their work and sending questions to teachers after school hours. Make greater use of learning support assistance in a way that enables the teachers to spend more time on quality first teaching and brilliant planning of inspiring lessons. Ensure your teaching assistants join live lessons. By managing the chat function, LSAs can respond to children's questions without interrupting the flow of the teacher's input. Also, ensure they are utilised to support with giving feedback to work that's been submitted. Screen-free Friday afternoons offer a multitude of benefits. It gives teachers time to plan and prepare for the next week and encourages children's well-being. We set the children some creative or active tasks that encourage them to get outside get exercise and explore away from their screens due to the significant amount of time they are spending on screens compared to normal. The EdTech Demonstrator website and the schools and colleges associated with them have created a bank of resources to help with setting up remote and hybrid learning. There are also high quality pre-recorded lessons to share, for example with Forest School or Music Lessons. Utilise these resources to help reduce the number of planned activities required in the day. If there is more than one class in a year group, have the classes together on the call with both teachers to start with. After the initial introduction, only one teacher remains on the call and the other leaves and manages the marking of the work that is submitted. This will also give opportunities for peer mentoring. The increased use of recorded lessons and live video lessons allows for more regular use of peer mentoring and support in school and across schools so that all teachers from NQTs to aspiring leaders can access a whole network of mentors. Teacher advocacy. Whilst not directly reducing teacher workload in the short term, the increased understanding and respect for teachers due to operating highly effective remote learning has increased trust. This has allowed more time for high value planning and research time for teachers. Ensure that every member of the school community is aware of the vision of what you are trying to achieve and can see the long-term impact that technology can have across the curriculum, raising standards with increased creativity and collaboration. I'm now going to hand over to Jonathan Dando, Director at Oak National Academy, who will talk more about how Oak materials can be used to support your remote education offer. Hello, I'm Jonathan Dando, one of the team at Oak National Academy, and I'm really delighted you're joining us to think more about remote education. Um, in our section today, I'm going to give you a quick run through of some of the Oak National Academy resources and tips on ways schools can make best use of them apart, as part of your plans. Um, I'm then going to hand over to three schools and colleges who are kindly going to share examples of the work they're doing right now. We're going to hear from Outwood Grange Academies Trust, who will cover how the curriculum can be delivered virtually, specifically their approach to delivery and what they include within their curriculum offer. National Star College will talk to us about EdTech for an accessible curriculum. And then the team from Fizi Park Farm Primary School 
or share thoughts on how to deliver the curriculum virtually through the provision of live lessons and pre-recorded materials and how to make use of digital notebooks. But first, let me start on Oak National Academy. So Oak was started by teachers for teachers. A group of teachers and school leaders came together in response to the initial lockdown um, to try and support their colleagues. Since then, we've been working with an ever-growing range of schools and teachers up and down the country, and we've been listening to your feedback to try and develop and improve what we offer. Throughout it all, our aim has been the same, to try and support teachers and school leaders so you can deliver high quality remote education for your pupils and to try and support and reduce teacher workload in such a challenging time. So with the backing of the Department for Education, Oak now has almost 10,000 pre-recorded high quality lessons. As well as the lessons, teachers can also access, download and edit lesson slides and pupil worksheets. And we also have our curriculum maps fully available as well for you to look at. Now, our lessons cover reception to year 11 across a, a range of core subjects. And we're always trying to add to more to that and um, because we think it's really important to have a broad and balanced curriculum. We also have 600 lessons for pupils who'd normally attend a specialist setting. Um, and we've been really delighted with the feedback that we've had from teachers and schools. Um, teachers tell us that Oaks resources have helped lower workload and improved teaching and learning in this challenging year. And we've been really blown away by the positive response. Um, pupils have now taken part in over 70 million lessons with Oak since the pandemic started, which is far beyond anything that we ever imagined when we put this thing together. Now, most people will know about our online classroom, but what I wanted to highlight to you is what's on your screen is our teacher hub. Now, this is where you and all your staff can, and I would really recommend that's where you should go. It provides the same access to those 10,000 or so lessons, but with lots more features to help teachers plan. And um, you can search by lessons by subject or by key stage, but also there's a, just a helpful search bar and you should pop in any topic that you want to check to see if there's a lesson or, or, or resources, slides and worksheets for um, in, in that search bar as well. Now, on the Teacher Hub, um, when you search by key, sta uh, key stage and subject, you'll get a page like this. So this is our Key Stage 3 history page. Um, so this is where you as teachers can find the curriculum map for the subject. That's those uh, green buttons uh, very subtly pointed out by that, that small red arrow. Um, now, these curriculum um, documents are really important um, and that's where we recommend that you start. Um, they provide an overview of all the units and lessons in that subject, how we've structured and developed it, any key concepts we cover, um, any order or prior knowledge that's required, and links to key texts and exam boards. Um, so the place for decisions on what to teach and curriculum decisions, that place is at your school by you um, and your school leadership team. You will have already thought really hard about that. Now at Oak, obviously we have a limited amount of resources and our curriculum is never going to exactly match um, any other and all the wide variety of curriculums that exist up and down the country. But downloading that curriculum map is a really good first step because what it allows you to do is quickly see where there may be overlap between your existing curriculum and what Oak offers. So once you've done that, you can then think about the different options that are going to happen. So hopefully there will be um, a number of cases where what you are what you were planning to teach already in your curriculum is matched by what the resources that are available on Oak. That's fantastic. Then you can use our resources and um, to support your remote, edu remote education without without much um, change or adaption. There might also be some cases where what we offer at Oak is close to your existing curriculum, but not in an exact match. And then you can choose whether you want to use the Oak resources as a basis, um, but maybe you want to add them. Um, adapt or edit them so they better align to your uh, own existing curriculum and um, but there are also going to be some cases where what we offer and what you uh, teach in your curriculum don't match and that's fine uh, that's going to be that's going to be the case because there's such a variety of curriculum and that's the right thing um, you can then obviously choose to draw on another provider or create your own resources we just hope that there's going to be some resources that you can draw on that's going to help and support you 
when you click through to a specific session, so a specific lesson on the Teach Hub, um, you'll see all the elements that make up the lesson. And um, that's obviously only available on the Teacher View. Uh, so most of our lessons have a video, a slide deck, a worksheet for pupils and a quiz. Our aim has been to replicate the phases of a classroom lesson as closely as possible, but obviously being mindful we're in an asynchronous pre-recorded setting. So the video will be led by a teacher providing an explanation of the topic with questions to ensure understanding and um, followed by practice tasks for pupils to undertake. Finally, there'll be uh, normally an exit quiz to check, to check understanding. Most of our lessons take um, in total about an hour for, for a student to complete. But that will vary slightly and you'll know your pupils best. Um, there's also a transcript of every lesson so you can quickly skim to see what the teacher covers. Um, and then again subtly with that big, big red arrow um, and it's pointing to two buttons in the top corner of the teacher hub which is share and download. Now firstly download so wherever copyright allows, and that's currently about 70% of the lessons and resources, um, you can download um thousands of ready made lesson slides and worksheets now that means that you can edit and adapt these slides and worksheets so they best suit your pupils and um, or they or, or you can edit and adapt them so they're better aligned to your existing curriculum you can also use those as a lesson planning aid um, and it also means that you because you can download them and edit them you can print them off to support students without devices for the share feature, um, that means that you can share that lesson directly into your VLE, perhaps setting it as an assignment for your class to do. Um, and when you do that, a little known feature is that actually you can customize the Oak lessons. So for example, you can turn it on or off different elements. So for example, you might want to set your own quiz and not use the Oak quiz, um, and you can do that um, uh, by that share, that share function there. So the guidance that's come out on remote education provides quite a lot of scope for different approaches because every school is going to be slightly different um, and, and your community is going to be different. Um, we were really pleased to see that it, um, this it specifically mentions that you can use pre-recorded Oak lessons as part of that offer. Um, and what we hope is that our resources are really flexible and that you can use them in different ways. And we're seeing teachers use Oak slightly differently um, and really innovatively. Now, the first thing to say is what Oak can never be, is it can never be a replacement for a teacher. What we're hoping is that using Oak, it frees up teachers to do the things that only they can do best. So that is providing feedback and putting effort into formative assessment, differentiation and pastoral support. Hopefully, Oak's resources give teachers a bit more time to do that. So as such, teachers are doing uh, using Oak in different ways. So we're seeing some set Oak lessons as part of a remote education timetable. And then they're kind of adding into that their own resources um, to support that lesson or perhaps their own worksheet alongside it. Some are setting a number of Oak lessons um, to, for, for students to do independently, but then following up with a live session, either with the whole class or small groups to do uh, live formative assessment and feedback. Some are also doing live lessons where teachers play the Oak video, but then the teacher it, with the class will pause the video and then check understanding and ask questions live. And um, so really interesting mix of using it just purely as pre-recorded, but also partly as live as well. We're also seeing some teachers download and edit those slide packs and using those when they're teaching um, pupils who are in school, so key workers or, or vulnerable children. Um, and that meaning that the, the, the kind of pupils who are at home doing Oak remotely and the pupils who are in school can say get the same curriculum continuity because they're having the same lesson. Um, now, it's been really fantastic to create Oak to support the response to the pandemic. But one of the really exciting things for us has been seeing that we put these resources out there and teachers have been using them in some really interesting ways that we hadn't expected at all. Um, I thought it might just be helpful to kind of cover a couple of those things. So um, as well as COVID, there are sometimes other reasons why a pupil is away from their school or from their teacher. It could be long term sick. And we're seeing that Oak is helping there. We've had some great conversations with um, hospital education schools, for example. We've also seen teachers use Oak as a ready-made structured resource to help catch up revision and homework. And we know that catch up is going to be um, a really important issue 
um, for, for, for quite a while still to come. At pre uh, this round of schools closing to the majority of pupils, Oak was also supporting when a pupil needed to come out of a class for some reason, um, but the teacher wanted to keep them learning. Um, so they were, using, they, were off, they were kind of putting them, uh, kind of giving them an Oak, an Oak lesson to do them. Um, it was also being used to support cover staff. So, you know, a, a teacher wakes up one morning and is ill and can't come in to, come in to, to teach their classes. Um, we were seeing teachers go on to Oak, identify a lesson that was going to be similar to what they're going to be teaching their class and, and send that to their to whoever's doing their cover lesson um, to support them in the planning and delivery of, of that cover. I mean, it's also been helping teachers when they needed for whatever reason to teach beyond the specialism that access to to see the see another lesson quickly. Um, and this has been really interesting for us to see how it's been embraced as a continuous professional development tool, something that we hadn't thought about at all at the start. Um, so in particular, early career teachers have been really disrupted by the pandemic. They've not been able to observe other teachers um, and teaching practice. Um, and we've seen some really innovative schools um, using Oak to support that. So obviously, um, observing an Oak lesson is not going to be the full experience. There's no behavior management going on just as an example, but hopefully it really helps um, all teachers, but particularly early career teachers to see another teacher and have access to this this pool um, where you've got ten, you know, nearly 10,000 lessons to talk about and show how you approach and, and explain a different topic. Um, we're seeing some schools take that one step further and having really rich conversations around um, using the Oak lessons as a basis. So kind of um, a group of teachers watching an Oak lesson and then having a rich conversation. What are the approaches um, that are being used in this lesson? What would we um, think is, is valuable in our context? What actually would we do very differently because our school context is different um, and, and perhaps we're, we're teaching in a different um, approach as well. Um, but really, just a really valuable uh, conversation starter. So that's nearly it from me. The last thing to say is that you can find lots more out on our website, including helpful how to guides, um, videos, templates for parents and templates for teachers, too. Uh, you can always get in touch with us via help at the national academy or for the latest updates, uh, news and when we're kind of bringing out new lessons or new resources, sign up for emails online and or follow us on social media. Now, uh, that's it from me. So I'm really pleased to hang hand over to colleagues uh, who will share their examples of how they're approaching remote education. Hi, I'm Tristan Kirkpatrick and I'm the Director of Computer Science for Outwood Grange Academies Trust. I'm also the EdTech Project Lead. So as a trust, um, we're a large trust in the north of England and we've gained more and more experience of using the Google platform over the, the recent lockdowns, but we've actually used the Google platform for around six or seven years now. So we've learned some things along the way and I thought it might be useful if I shared a little bit about that. And what I wanted to focus on is the way that we can use EdTech to provide a truly robust curriculum for our learners. So when I talk about curriculum, um, I'm talking about everything that happens within our schools from the resources that teachers are using to um, deliver their lessons, all the way down to those, those, those small conversations that staff will have with students regularly in corridors that make what a school um, that make a school what it is. So our curriculum is everything. And now more than ever, our curriculum needs to remain robust. And we want to seamlessly switch to being able to deliver our curriculum online. So a truly robust curriculum is consistent regardless of the challenges and the delivery vehicle we use. And obviously within our Grange Academies Trust, we use Google Workspace, but there are a lot of very similar platforms that schools are using very successfully. And our approach to delivering our curriculum, um, we're not prescriptive by any means. So we have a number of teachers delivering across from primary all the way to secondary, and we don't have a single approach that we you know, ask our teachers to use. It's very much dependent on those learners within their classrooms. But we do have some best practices. So synchronous lessons or live lessons in real time have been working really well for us. And what we've actually found is that we found an increase in engagement 
for our disadvantaged students which has been which has been a massive thing for us because it means that we're getting students who potentially weren't engaging as much in the asynchronous tasks and lessons uh, engaging much more so um, live lessons for us has been a, a big impact the pre-recorded um, resources that, that students can prog progress at their own pace is also a really valid way of teaching and quite often some expert explanations provided for students with some really um, clear, concise tasks are exactly what that student needs and, and that's been working well. So sometimes our teachers might um, mix these uh, methods up a little bit depending on the class. Uh, we also have links to other platforms. So for example, Oak National Academy, which the Outward Grange Academy Trust have contributed to, um, are a fantastic wealth of resources and where appropriate, those resources have been used within our, within our classrooms. And we also have our Outward Online Learning Library, which is a, a library put together by our expert subject directors that teachers can draw upon um, and you know, use and modify resources from there. And then there's the there's the Hegarty Maths and Timetable Rockstars, that sort of thing that we've also got going on in our secondary and primary schools. So a real combination of those things is what our approach is to delivering this curriculum in the virtual classroom. And we try to mirror as much as possible what would be happening happening in a physical classroom. So feedback has been fantastic from our live lessons. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, has, has seen a massive increase in engagement. Um, and fundamentally, and I think this is a really key point, the role of a teacher in, in this setup has not changed. The teacher for still facilitates the learning and it is just the method in which they deliver this learning is, is slightly different and does require you know, some extra things to make, make happen and make work. Um, some things that have been working really well is we've had like team teaching and buddy systems going on with, with teachers. Um, especially NQTs and RQTs to help their development. And we've also been shortening lessons to building breaks from the screen for both our teachers and our students because, you know, that screen fatigue, that almost te techno overload um, can be a, a quite a thing with teachers who are moving to working on screens all day, whereas th where they're not used to doing that. So there's been some incredible things happening, um, both within our own Academy Trust and in schools that we work with as part of the EdTech Demonstrator Program, um, schools nationally. And I think the key word to this is, is creativity. We've got PE teachers delivering PE lessons in their, in their living rooms. We've got art teachers setting, um, setting students off on tasks where they uh, are investigating things in their own house and drawing them and taking photos, uploading them and sharing with the, their peers. Um, we've even had food tech lessons with teachers cooking along by the side next to the students um, on laptops and on devices. So there's some really creative things that have happened and there's absolutely things that will be taken forward from maybe some of the more, um, some of the lockdown measures that we've had to put in place. Something that's crucial and we are very aware of in schools at the moment is maintaining that welfare of staff and students. Um, there's some things that we've put in place and I know there's a lot of schools we work with as part of the demonstrator have put in place, but student welfare, things like student drop-ins so that they can drop in to speak to their teacher at a certain time of day um, if they've got any concerns. Tutor time for some of our older students, which just gives students a chance to interact with each other outside of a, maybe a subject classroom context. We've also looked at moving transition arrangements. So I'm not just talking about year six to year seven kind of transition, but also year seven to year eight, year eight to year nine transition um, and putting together kind of digital packages versions of that so that students are secure in the knowledge that their next destination um, is is, is what they expect it to be. And we are really mindful of techno overload. So we do believe that the expert instruction and clear, concise, structured tasks are sometimes enough for our learners. Although we do like to mix it up sometimes with really exciting kind of new um, new tech that we've, we've found or experimenting with, which is fantastic. And I think that balanced diet is exactly what they need. So staff welfare, uh, there's no expectation for staff to be entirely live for 60 minutes. We build breaks in. Um, we use a very shared 
um, and an open collaborative approach to planning. So um, a lot of our subject directors facilitate that within our trust. And I know schools, um, some schools external to our trust are working with um, groups of heads of department and that sort of thing is fantastic. Um, the likes of Oak National Academy being able to provide resources as well. You know, if it's there, use it would be my advice. Um, we are reducing timetables and pair teaching wherever is, is viable, especially for our NQTs and RQTs. Um, providing a balance of content and, um, and making sure that we're sharing the fantastic feedback that parents are giving. And I know schools up and down the country are getting incredible feedback. And I think sometimes it's great to directly share that with staff because um, the feedback that I've had from staff is that that is what is keeping them going in a lot of ways. So I'll say it again, the role of our teachers has not changed at all. Everything that they, every all of their skills are, are valuable, if not more valuable in this context than ever. Um, within our own trust, and I know that there are other schools who do this, um, we've got an ed tech leader structure within our schools. And what that's enabled us to do is provide our teachers the training that they need to be able to deliver all of those skills and knowledge and expertise um, to the students on an online platform. So our ed tech leader structure has been working with schools to rapidly upskill workforce where required um, and, and to make sure teachers are comfortable and confident using the new technologies. Something that has worked incredibly well to increase engagement for our students has been engaging directly with parents and really clear communication with parents. So a couple of things that we have um, that, are, that are used day in, day out is the home learning support website that we have set up for our Academy Trust, which means that parents can go on there and it also supports parents in supporting their child. So there's some great advice on there and there's, there's a lot of advice around for parents now, which I think is fantastic because they are in a position where they have to facilitate the learning in some way to be able to link them up with their teachers. And then we use something called um, Google, Google Guardians, which provides parents a report um, on work that is set and work that should be collected in and completed. And it gives them some deadlines as well. So it means that um, it means parents can help students organize their day and their workload the same way that teachers in school would help students organize their day and workload. So clear communication and then rapidly intervening with students where engagement maybe isn't what it could be um, or if students are having issues with connectivity. Um, we have systems in place to pick that up very quickly and um, we, we're straight onto the phone to parents. So parents are really crucial in making all of this happen and I, and I can't stress that enough. So we have a number of systems of monitoring and support in place. We, we've, got, we've got masses of analytics data for engagement and, atten and attendance to lessons. Um, but often we use the real-time data for, for maximum impact. So if a student isn't in a lesson when um, the lesson started, if it's a live lesson, we have our learning managers instantly contacting home. Um, we've also, as a result of the, um, the changes to our ways of working, we have welfare call system to check up on vulnerable students. Um, it's systemized to ensure that no students are left out and that every vulnerable student receives the phone calls they need to receive and the support they need. And we've got a really open development focused approach to supporting staff. And we do that fund mainly for the technical um, support through our ed tech leader structure, which, is, which has worked incredibly well this year. So what makes a truly robust curriculum, um, a curriculum that we can, we can flip to online learning if we need to, a curriculum that can be delivered in schools? And I think that is all of these elements applied consistently, whether in school or out of school. Um, a willingness to change from staff, which you know teachers up and down the country have been willing to do, and we've seen them um, rapidly improve their skills in, in, you know, in the platform of their school, that the school has chosen and anyone could be forgiven thinking that the system is the most important thing but as always it's the people that run the systems and the people within the systems um, that make it successful and that includes our our staff our students um, and our leadership so a truly robust curriculum is all of those things applied consistently and 
our delivery vehicle at the moment for our curriculum is EdTech. Hello and uh, welcome to EdTech for an Accessible Curriculum uh, with myself, Neil Beck. Um, so if you'd like to uh, stay in touch, uh, you can follow me uh, at Twitter uh, down there below. Um, and today I'm just going to be taking you through a short introduction to what you can consider to make an accessible curriculum. There'll be lots of resources and guides to send you elsewhere. Um, there's only so much we can do today, uh, but hopefully it's the start or the continuation of a journey you have with accessibility. So I work for National Star College. Um, and I deliver assessments, training, consultation at a national and international level. Um, I also work for NATSPEC, who are the National Specialist College Association. Uh, we authored uh, the TechAbility Standards, which are a free resource where you can assess what level you are on a number of different factors around assistive technology. I was also the co-project lead for assistive technology work in Europe, where we've managed to define the assistive technologist role and build a set of competencies and skills that that role needs. Uh, also we've done some work in India um, with vocational centers and that's helped me to focus on mobile technologies and of course focused on um, some policy development with groups such as the APGAT and the AT experts group uh, which led on to the EdTech demonstrator program that um, we'll be talking a little bit about. So these are the key features um, that I've pulled out as to um, an accessible curriculum. So we're going to be going through each one in turn. So first one is, you, is your curriculum available to access with commonly used assistive technology? So we're talking here about text to speech. So can the re text be read out from the page? Can we use dictation to speak with our voice and write text down? Can we use prediction to complete the next word or help me with some reassurance on spelling? Can we use magnification to zoom in on, on the document? And finally, can we access the phys physical kit that we sometimes need um, to access the technology? So the next one is, can we have a, a curriculum delivery that's suitable? Um, this involves a few different thoughts. So various different activities such as quil quizzes, polls, um, and looking at things like uh, Flipgrid, as we've got example on the right-hand side where students and teachers can uh, submit their work or set the work in different formats. So rather than just text-based. Are you working live or pre-recorded? Um, there's different elements to, to both. Are you using captions? Um, as part of your curriculum delivery. Uh, these are accessible for those with um, learning disabilities, um, also hearing impaired, and those who have problems with their technical equipment, which happens all too often. Think about the timings and the length. There's no need to have a, a solid hour block um, with, with students. Um, it's probably too long for an awful lot, especially those with any kind of issues around attention. So shorter sessions are better. Um, and think about the activities that you're doing within those sessions. What needs to be done live and what can be done separately and independently. Consider the format of it. So uh, taking on elements of flipped, um, enriched virtual and role reversal. Um, so we've done uh, a webinar on this for the EdTech uh, Thursdays webinar program uh, where we talked a bit about flipped. Um, enriched virtual is more about using the virtual for what is what is best done virtually and the rest done outside of it. Role reversal is just letting your learners teach you about things. So choosing a subject, helping them to do some research and then letting them teach you um, about it, uh, which can be quite entertaining and uh, yeah, exciting. Um, so accessible formats is the next part of what makes an, um, an accessible program. Um, we've got on here a picture of the built-in captions 
um, on the top of the top picture there. So that's in Microsoft Teams. Um, we've also at the bottom got uh, control and mouse wheel. Uh, this is one of my favorite tips for learners to, um, if you're using a mouse, uh, to be able to zoom in. A lot of people know um, the kind of pinch action uh, to zoom in and out, but the control and mouse wheel is quite useful in Windows where you don't have a touch screen. Uh, so headings is also important. Um, I'm just going to show an example of some headings for you. So this is a document that I prepared earlier, Great Blue Peter. Um, I'm going to use the built-in tools in Microsoft Word to format this. So the title is example document. So I'll give that title. Uh, the headings is my first heading. That's not confusing at all. Uh, index is my next heading. Search function. And then these are all headings as well. Here we go. So this is quite useful because it means that we can have um, default styles set up. So you can create a style, you can change each one of these. And as it changes one of them, it will change all the headings. So you don't have to go back through them individually. So at that point, it's a tool that can help you um, just to kind of speed up your building of resources. But there's a lot more to it than that. So if we go to view and we go to navigation pane, what's happened is, is Word has recognized now that we have those headings. So we can quickly navigate the document. So this is useful for those with um, learning disabilities, also useful to not be able to scroll down um, if there's multiple pages. And this also means that we can insert a uh, table. Um, so that is, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, always forget where to do these references. That's it. Uh, references, table of contents, and then if we put in a table of contents there, it's written there with all the numbers. If I then publish this as a PDF, um, you can actually click on those headings, and it will take you through the document. Um, so learners are really used to navigating the web and clicking on links to follow things. So it can be uh, worth trying that with learners, um, especially if you can take that through them and it creates accessible documents and it's also a productivity tool and it will make your work look more professional. So that's just one example of um, a crossover between the two. I'm just going to go back to my presentation now. Okay, so we've covered headings, we've covered index. Um, the search function was also built in there, so you can search for keywords that you want to find. Zoom with reflow means that as you zoom in on the text, the text moves so that you can still read it. Uh, that's that's built into lots of um, things now, but if you've got a picture of something with some text on, that won't happen. So that's worth considering not to have a picture with text in it that, that it contains pertinent information. That brings us on to descriptions for pictures, uh, where you should look at using alt text. Uh, there's also subtitles and captions, as we've mentioned, that are really important. Additional support, um, it's worth considering building templates for what we've just discussed with the titles. Uh, it's worth considering assessment for learners who need extra support. Mental health is a focus, and we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow um, in block three and training for your staff is also important. Uh, the final one is, is, does your curriculum, is your curriculum a complete curriculum? So does it cover organization and timekeeping, travel training, healthy living, um, employer, future education and care links? These are all things that we can focus on with accessibility and can, can be met with technology. Um, so if, you're, if you've been interested in any of these and you want more details, um, you can visit bit.ly A-T-T-H-U-R-S. Um, make sure you've got the caps sorted with that. And that will take you to our past webinars and also to all upcoming uh, webinars. So I won't go through those now. Um, but we've got uh, we've got text to speech coming up, dictation um, coming up again because those were popular. Um, we've also got literacy tools, accessible documents, parents and carers, 
and talking a bit about the techability standards I mentioned earlier. You can find further SEND support through the SEND, EdTech SEND support hub. Um, the link is at the bottom of the slide there, bit.ly forward slash SENDNS, all caps at the end. Um, and what we're doing is we're creating some champions who can support learners in schools and will provide uh, support around this. We're providing some teacher training, focusing at the different phases. We're providing leadership training, um, obviously uh, supporting those in leadership positions in schools and colleges and learner assessment. So if you've got any learners you want to drill down a bit more with and find out more about, then you can work with those. Um, so yeah, hopefully at the end of this, we'll have um, uh, a kind of network um, of people with this kind of knowledge and uh, the advice and guidance being given can have accessibility integrated. Um, if you are interested in anything that you've heard about the EdTech SEND support, that link there again is bit.ly and then SENDNS. Um, but for EdTech demo support, uh, you can visit edtech-demonstrator.lgfl.net. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Firstly, thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. We hope that you will find it useful and that it will support your own thinking about the EdTech journey you and your schools are currently on. We are happy for schools to contact us for further information or to maybe share their story with us. Our Twitter details are available at the end of the presentation. So we will be looking at how Feasy Park Farm have implemented an effective and bespoke learning opportunities during lockdown, um, but more importantly as well, looking beyond lockdown um, when we get back to our new normal. So Feasy Park Farm Primary School, we are currently an EdTech demonstrator school which means that we are working um, alongside the DfE um, to support schools across England um, with their EdTech provision. Um, and we will share how since lockdown one, um, we have developed our offer to the children. Um, and we've done that by using a range of software, um, including Smart, um, which has effectively helped us provide synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning opportunities. Hello everybody. I would like to introduce the EdTech team at Visi Park Farm Primary School. Sarah Morgan is Assistant Head Teacher, Training School Director and is the lead person for the EdTech Demonstrator Programme. Louise Everson is Senior Teacher, EdTech Trainer accredited by both Smart and Microsoft. Lely Begum is class teacher with responsibility for EdTech across the setting. Dr David Wiley from YTech Consulting is our consultant and advisor. At Feezy, we very much keep the child at the centre. Teachers plan bespoke learning journeys for the children, which are sequenced, progressive, and also pitched for individual needs when necessary. Teachers' workload is a constant issue in our profession, but right now it is so important that it is managed correctly. We ask staff to spend time creating one bespoke digital learning file. There is no double planning. That one file can be used for dual audiences. Our critical and key worker children who are in school and also for the children who are working remotely from home. The same approach is taken when the whole class are in school and there's one child isolating. We drive ourselves to provide equality in all our provision. We ensure children move on in their learning by building on previous outcomes and we use assessment features to help us work out which children can move on and which need further input. Overall, the well-being of our children is key. We provide a range of learning pathways for them to cover core, non-core and the social side of school life. Active learning is at the forefront of our provision. 
It's really important to us that learning is personalised for pupils and that feedback moves the learning forwards. For example, we've used the features of OneNote to include personalised stickers and audio comments for pupils. It's really important that children can still hear their teacher's voice even if they are not currently in school. Excellent work, Lucy. Well done for going back, checking your work and adding the missing punctuation in, in the spaces. I wonder if you can now look at adding a fronted adverb to your writing. Feezy have used the features of SmartLab to make learning active and not passive to students whilst working remotely, using Shout It Out and other SmartLab activities. This has been really exciting for the children as during our live lessons they've been able to log on to hellosmart.com, put in the teacher code and send their ideas to the board via a second device or by opening a new tab in their browser whilst on Teams. The children have absolutely loved seeing their ideas appear on the screen live in real time and the teachers have really enjoyed having that interactivity with their classes and being able to give real time feedback to the pupils. We use our assessment to plan the following week's sessions. Children are given regular feedback and have opportunities to respond to them. The mixture of synchronous and asynchronous activities have connected children and have become an extension of our classrooms. We found it really beneficial to combine Smart Learning Suite Online with OneNote during lockdown and beyond. We've been able to share our digital learning files with pupils. Uh, we affectionately call them wrappers because they wrap around the learning. Children have been able to click on the link in their OneNote workspace and go directly to the digital learning file. Here they can access the learning for the week, review anything that they want to go back to and play the interactive games that we provide for pupils. This has been fantastic for them as it means the learning comes alive on the screen and they don't have to leave the environment of OneNote to do this, it just opens in a new tab. Children do love to please and they do genuinely want praise. The important crux is having the platform to provide praise, encouragement and support when things are difficult. By not getting the workflow correct, children could quickly lose interest, become unmotivated and have a what's the point attitude. Our children want to keep learning, so we provide them with the opportunities. For example, we set extension activities in OneNote and we try to personalise learning to their interests. We will not lose this approach and it will be a positive takeaway from the pandemic. We will move to a continuous learning offer for all. When working with schools as part of the demonstrator programme, a frequent question is how do you get children engaging with their learning when they are accessing it remotely? The key element we have found is to use what your children love doing at the forefront and wrap the academic side around it. Our core learning content sits integrated in our online school, which is accessed through a learning platform. The children navigate through their virtual school each morning to access their work. Whilst navigating, they are greeted with welcome messages, assemblies, PE challenges, singing rehearsals and art projects, which they are able to contribute to. They might have whole school, year group and class based projects to add their thoughts to. By creating this ethos, hopefully no child feels alone. They are all part of our community. They also thoroughly enjoy daily discussions or chit chats that the teacher instigates. We know and understand how valuable the playground dialogue is for our children. We feel that when the children's emotional, social and well-being needs are met, they are then in the correct frame of mind for learning to take place. It's important to remember that children aren't vessels we can pour information into. We need to personalise learning for our pupils and children need to be active learners, continuing to build core values such as positive growth mindset, resilience, pride and determination. We need to keep the child in the centre, address all their needs just like we do in real life and then we have a chance that real learning will take place. 
We have personalised learning through the use of live lessons with interactive activities delivered through Smart Notebook, differentiated work set on Microsoft OneNote and links to extension activities on external websites such as Education City, Oak Academy and Purple Mash, where content can be tailored specifically for pupils. The use of personalised stickers and audio comments on Microsoft OneNote have also enabled us to leave personalised feedback for pupils. Parental engagement is absolutely key. We sympathise with parents who are supporting their children's online learning from home. We think it's essential to provide clear instructions and include digital content that clearly explains the learning that is taking place. For example, this can be achieved through creating teacher recorded content using tools such as PowerPoint slideshow recorder, but also utilising learning videos as well. For example, the learn screens and activities on Education City. We believe that in order to help our children, we must support all around them. We support our parents with the use of a dedicated support email account that parent carers can contact. This is manned by our school technician. We have parental workshops to support parents with remote learning and we have created video guides and handout guides that parents can refer to if they are unable to attend our workshops. Thank you for listening to our presentation today. We hope that you have taken away some ideas and strategies which will help you to further enhance EdTech provision in your settings. Here are our details. Please contact us if you would like any further information or advice or details of the training sessions that we can offer. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, we've got here today uh, two experts to talk about some questions that I know everyone has on their mind um, in terms of online learning, looking at some of the technology uh, considerations that we need to make as teachers today. So could I welcome uh, Tristan Kirkpatrick? Hi David, nice to see everyone. I'm uh, Tristan Kirkpatrick. I'm the Director of Computer Science at Outward Grange Academies Trust and I also lead on our EdTech project too. And can I introduce Neil Beck? Great, thanks David. Um, yeah, my name's Neil Beck. I'm the Assistive Technologist for National Star College um, and we've been part of the EdTech Demonstrator Programme where we've been supporting schools and colleges with accessible technology. And uh, yeah, just to say thanks for having us here today. Okay, we're going to start with the, uh, the first question. Um, and this is, when can technology help with support for mental health? Great. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is a question that's definitely top of my list um, at the moment. Uh, for our Accessible Tech Thursdays webinars, we actually scheduled um, our webinar for the 8th of um, January. And I don't think we realized how important that was going to be at the time. Um, and yeah, the feedback was really good. And what I've actually got is um, I've just pulled out a few key slides from that webinar that might help us answer that question. So the, the first is knowing at what point um, can we help with technology and at what point do we actually need to get more help um, and further assistance. So um, on this slide here, it's quite a useful um, little guide as to where, what stage you're at on the kind of um, mental health spectrum. So we can see at the, at the beginning there, um, you've got kind of healthy, which is normal functioning. So um, I don't think many of us are probably at a green point right now, but that's taking things in stride, consistent performance, normal sleep patterns, um, usual self-confidence, comfortable with others. Um, yeah, I'm sure some of us are, are having problems with those right now. Um, so then the next stage up is reacting and that's common and reversible distress. So that's irritable, impatient, nervousness, um, procrastination, forgetfulness trouble sleeping, um, lowered energy, difficulty in relaxing, decreased social activity. Well, I think that's for everyone again. Um, 
and these are the kind of levels that we we can cover really with mental health and technology alone that's not to say you can't use technology for the kind of the more serious conditions but at that point you should really be looking for um some uh expertise around that with someone with um some qualifications and um experience around mental health um so then the upper orders are kind of injured um where you've got real anger um anxiety really strong kind of decreased performance all the way up to actually ill um where you've got significant difficulties with your emotions um depressed mood and those kind of levels so what I can do is just go through some of the ways that we can use technology at that healthy and reacting point. Um, and I hope that will be helpful for people. Um, so the first, first thing is, is why am I covering this kind of area given that my focus is on learning disabilities? Well, it's because it's such a, a comorbidity with learning disabilities. Um, we're looking at between 25% to 40% of people with learning disabilities also having mental health problems. So if you can consider that, that the impact that that has on people who are already in, at times, a very difficult situation. So uh, for children and young people, um, a diagnosable psychiatric disorder is 30% in children and adolescents with learning disabilities compared to just 8% without. Um, and these young people were also 33 more likely, times more likely to be on the autistic spectrum, which I think is an important um, area to cover whenever we're talking about mental health um, and disabilities. Um, so this source is actually from the Foundation for People with Learning Disabilities, and I've, I've included that there. And um, we'll see if we can get the slides out to you. Um, so what else can we do? Um, well, I've got some different apps just to give you ideas. And there's so many apps out there. There's so much out there that it's, it's quite hard to navigate. Um, but what I've tried to do today is just cover a range of these. So there'll be some different kind of levels for different people. So uh, the first one is Dreamy Kid. Um, so this is uh, it's a meditation, affirmation and healing activities app. Um, it's really useful for supporting um, ADD, ADHD, and eating disorders, um, but it also includes sleep sounds and sleep stories. Um, and that's been reported to be quite useful with the younger kind of um, age groups. Um, an app for kind of all ages is Headspace, um, and this is I I available on iOS and Android, um, and it teaches you how to meditate. Um, it's a really good app, um, and I. I recommend it and um, I know some organizations take this on an organizational level so that um, people can use these things. Uh, Sesame Street have produced another good one for primary pupils and um, one of the feedback is that we, we haven't um, always been able to deliver enough resources at primary level on this so I think it's really important to pull these out. Uh, so this is for early years and reception pupils, it's available on iOS and it can teach skills such as problem solving, self-control, uh, planning and task persistence. Um, I love the look of this one. This is uh, Mindful Powers and um, it, it gamifies um, mental health, um, which if you consider how motivational um, playing computer games is for a lot of young people, um, this is a really fun one. Um, and this was actually recommended to me um, uh, the other day and I, I've, I've enjoyed having a play about with it. it it's really good. So um, it teaches mindful play. Um, it's got uh, improves focus time and it's got a, a task timer feature. Uh, Chill Panda um, is another good one. It's being tested by the NHS um, and it measures heart rates and suggests activities based on the pupil's state of mind. So I think this is really important because depending at what point a learner is on, on a scale, whether they're kind of um, reaching the level where they're just getting starting to get anxious or whether they're at a point of kind of really struggling, um, depends on how you should be reacting to that. Um, so I think the NHS's focus on this is because it does um, work at what level the learner's at. Um, it also teaches breathing techniques, which is really useful. Uh, mindful Nats, um, similar, um, but pitched specifically for K KS2 and KS3 pupils. Um, it's available on iOS and Android. 
um, and yeah, exercises to raise awareness of body, mind, and world. Uh, Smiling Mind, similar, but I definitely wanted to mention that because it's developed by educators and psychologists. So those were a selection of, of apps that can help um, to improve the situation and give people coping skills. Another useful thing that we can do with technology is to figure out where learners are at and identify problem areas. One of my favorites within this is Dalio, and this is an app that I've used for a, a few different learners. And it is a really good way, especially if you're only seeing a learner once ever so often, of finding out what they've been doing and how that's made them feel. Um, so you, uh, the, the uh, input is really accessible. So you've got um, uh, a rad to awful scale there. So you can choose how you're feeling. Um, you can say what you've been up to and you can choose custom icons and custom activities. So you can make it fit your, your learner. It's a really simple user interface. Um, and what I really like is there's a really detailed output as well. So you can get a good idea of how, how your learners have been and um, again, it gamifies it. So learners are kind of seeing what they've been doing and what's made them happy. So they start to take ownership of that. Um, nutrition is a big part of uh, mental health. Um, and rather than recommending individual apps, I always like to recommend the NHS because they have a, an ongoing process of reviewing these. Um, and uh, that's that's really important, I think, to have an ongoing process where you're looking at what's useful and what's evidence-based. Um, and on to the final thing, really, that, that um, I wanted to cover from uh, mental health and what you can do with technology is um, you can improve your sleeping patterns and you can improve your bursts of concentration. So Sleep Town is uh, an app where you can set up your town to grow overnight as long as you fall asleep within a certain period and wake up within a certain period. Um, so it's gamified. Um, it's quite interesting. I think I, um, I tried it out when I was doing quite a substantial project and I think I managed two houses. So see if you can beat that. Um, it should be pretty easy. Um, it's free. Um, it's got some premium options to join friends and things like that. Um, the goals are customizable. And if you like the idea of that, but want to apply it to um, individual tasks through the day, um, also check out Forest, um, because that's the same equivalent, but the short periods of concentration. Um, and it, um, both of these make sure that you have to stay in the app for, for you to achieve these goals. So it means that you're not gonna get distracted and go on Facebook and things like that. Okay. Um, Oh, one more to mention um, around autism because of the because um, as I said, there's a there's a lot of crossover there. There's a, a complete support system from Brain in Hand, um, and this actually has an app that can lay out your day. It can identify where the key problems are, and you put in your own um, support uh, kind of goals in there, so you can follow those. So it's a really useful app um, and uh, it's beyond an app because it's a, a complete support system. So that's worth checking out. Um, so hopefully that's given um, some ideas of some of the things that you can use technology for mental health. Um, and I, I realize uh, that was a long answer, but it, it was just the question that I, I like the looks of the most. So hope you don't mind that I gave a bit more on that. No, that's extremely useful, Neil, and I'm sure there are plenty of things that people would want to um, look at there. Um, Tristan, um, do you want to add anything to that about how you check on a student well-being? So for us in, in primary and secondary schools, um, we're obviously using a digital platform to deliver our curriculum at the moment. And we, we found it really useful to actually put distinct kind of well-being tasks in there for students to get some indication as to how students are feeling that day because obviously students are facing significant challenges with it in in the ways in which students are needing to work as are you know teachers and and other staff within school so Neil what you said there was really useful and there's certainly things that I can take away from that so thank you for that. Oh, pleasure. Okay well thanks guys uh, let's move on to our second question um, which is um, 
What are your top tips for pupil engagement? Okay. Um, so I think there's a, there's some things that we've found and my angle is always from um, a kind of accessibility point of view. So my focus is going to be on there. So I'll be interested to see what, what Tristan says back to this, but um, for me, I found that visual contact with pupils and their families is important. Uh, we've seen lots of people at this stage delivering um, either synchronous, which means, you know, live sessions to, to learners or asynchronous where they're recorded and sent out. And also um, other organizations where they're just sending resources. And we've found that there are benefits to live sessions and there are benefits to the recording did sessions and less so I think my, just my own view in just sending resources out um, I think that visual contact um, is really important and that ability to react um, and change things um, so whether that's questions at the end or giving the learner an activity um, I think it's really important to have that um, I think it's good to have time for pupils to socialize with their peers um, in a normal kind of school or college environment, we'd have that. And those might be the favorite parts of our day, you know, and um, I think we need to try and build that in wherever possible. Um, it, it might be their only opportunity and it might make the whole thing a lot more enjoyable for them. Um, it's good to obviously, I mean, it sounds obvious, but vary activities and vary resources as much as possible. Um, I think people can use the uh, communities that are out there, um, including the EdTech Demonstrator program, where the, the um, schools and colleges there will be sharing best practice and give you ideas on activities and resources. Um, and I suppose also just to kind of consider your delivery style. Um, you know, are you doing, are you considering the idea of flipped learning? Are you doing quizzes um, and that sort of thing? Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, uh, Tristan, how do you ensure that uh, students uh, are engaged in lessons? So I think I think Neil has hit the nail on the head with that visual contact for students in lesson, whether that be, you know, a live lesson or whether that be using some of the brilliant feedback tools that are out there to provide that kind of visual or that, that exchange between the student and a, and a teacher is it, so, so important. Um, one thing that we have kind of noticed across our large trust is that actually by doing the, the kind of live lessons uh, and, and giving that, that social exchange with, with class and with the teacher and with students, um, it's, it's actually improved engagement for our disadvantaged students, um, which was really interesting. And, I, and I'm not sure if that is a, you know, if that would be the same nationally, but for us, it, it's absolutely key. So having opportunities both across primary and secondary school where it may not be a live lesson, it might be drop-in tutor time sessions that students can go in and attend and spend some time with their class or their teacher um, is, is certainly extremely valuable. And, and again, to echo Neil, the EdTech Demonstrator program is really good for this if, if schools are looking for some kind of specific and bespoke training for their school setting, the EdTech Demonstrator program will certainly be able to help point towards some things that might make um, lessons or learning more engaging for the students in, in their schools. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much for those. Um, we'll just move on to our next question. Um, how do you ensure staff and learners don't get digital fatigue? That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, so the the side of things that I can probably cover the best is to talk about how how technology can help here and what we've got built into devices that can help. Um, and I, I think I'd I'd love to hear from Tristan as to kind of um, how that happens in practice. Um, so I've just got a few more slides that are quite useful. And again, these are from the mental health app. So if you if you go on to Accessible Tech Thursdays on YouTube. You can find all these resources and slides. Um, so I've just covered the um, different devices. So each device has its own way of um, making sure that you don't overuse and you have wind down time. So uh, for Android, um, you've got Google's wind down. 
Um, it puts your phone into do not disturb mode. Um, it allows you to blanket disable most of your apps like iOS does. Um, and in grayscale, all the colors drained out from your phone screen. In Apple, uh, they've got downtime, and this will allow you to set up a few apps that can always be used. Um, so your phone or your text messaging, just the core apps really. Um, and the blocked apps will be darkened on your home screen. And for Windows, um, there's Microsoft Family Groups on Windows 10. Um, and this allows every, you to put everyone in your family who has a free Microsoft account under one digital umbrella. Uh, it's managed on a website where you can change the limits there. Um, and it, it's quite user friendly once you get into it. So those are kind of very briefly what I'd say are the, are the kind of technical ways you can do that outside of lesson times. Mm -hmm. And then I think down to the individual schools and colleges, they've probably got their own um, policies and kind of ways of doing that. Is that fair to say, Tristan? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we've got this thing at the moment, haven't we, where where techno overload could be, you know, that those words could be used here, that students are learning in a complete new way, that they, they might be using several brand new tools to them online um, in, in their lessons. And I think there's, there's almost that, that danger of, of, of overstimulating that. And I think for us, it's, it's been about looking at how we can ensure this is a sustained thing for students and not a sprint and looking at ways that we can, we can build in perhaps to lessons, um, you know, really distinct break times. Um, a good example, a school that we were working with, um, generally um, when students were in the school, physically in the school, their lessons will be 60 minutes long. And, and obviously the way it works in schools is, is um, you might not get a 60 minute lesson just because your lesson is timetabled 60 minutes long. There's the change over time. There's the, those little small social interactions that all form part of what a school is. So um, we've certainly looked at building it into a lot of our lessons in, across our trust, um, especially when they are predominantly live lessons online, building in times to say to students, you know, now's, now's a good time, go and get a drink, have a little wander around, then come back and everyone's more focused, ready to learn. Um, I think it's really valuable. And I think it's something that's going to get even more important the longer this kind of this period where students are learning online goes on. So I think it's all about how do we sustain it with our students? It's not a sprint. That's brilliant. That's really useful information. Um, thanks, thanks very much for sharing that with us. Um, we're just gonna to go to our next uh, question now. Um, and this is uh, top tips for uh, synchronous lessons. Uh, what do you need for a safe, accessible lesson? We'd like to start with that. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm happy to start with that. I think um, I think there's the, the two key words there are safe and accessible, and, and Neil might be able to fill in a little bit more kind of detail with it with the accessibility side. But in terms of a safe um, lesson, I think what it comes down to in the, in the first instance is that is that staff and student training so that they know how to use the tools available to them in a really safe way. Um, now, that's something that a lot of schools will build into their curriculum from quite early on and, and is something that probably wasn't new to them for you know, lockdown situations. But I think it's absolutely key that the students have a good knowledge of the learning platform um, for safeguarding needs and as do the staff. And in terms of accessibility, um, I always kind of come back to this, that when teachers are setting tasks and when um, students are working on tasks online, quite often much clearer advice is, you know, rather than the kind of all singing, all dancing tools that students have to go off to quite often, um, some really good expert instruction can really help with the accessibility for some students. We're also looking at ways, and we've worked with schools who are looking at ways to ensure that, for example, TAs can join breakout rooms to work with students, to enable them to access the learning a lot better because it's an entirely different scenario, isn't it, for our, our, our TAs and support staff too. So I think they're very important people to understand how this new way of learning works for them. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, accessibility, students need to be able to access it. So they need the devices to be able to get on there in the first place. And I guess that's another kind of 
conversation. But Neil, I, I, you know, I'd really, um, I'd really be interested in your thoughts on that. Great. Um, so I think we've got um, just a few minutes left. So I don't want to spend too long on this because I know I know accessibility was covered yesterday. Um, but probably the best thing for me to do is just to say if you are interested in accessibility there's kind of two kind of main routes for you to take if you want one-to-one -one school support and advice um, you can go to the edtech demonstrator um, kind of site so that's edtech-demonstrator.lgfl.net um, for all kind of edtech send support inquiries so that's things like assessments um, becoming a champion uh, training schemes specifically around edtech and SEND, uh, then you can visit bit.ly uh, forward slash SENDNS, and that's all in, in caps locks. Um, and that there's so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, use, use the built-in tools, um, find out what information is out there, uh, attend the Accessible Tech Thursdays webinars. Um, those are the kind of key key takeaways i think that's brilliant um thanks very much yeah we are we're running short of time um so uh um what we want to do now is just go through uh just a couple more questions um so the, the next question is going to be drum roll Drum roll, drum roll, here you go. Uh, how are teachers using their lesson structure to help their students with screen time issues? Now, there's a good question. Yeah, I think, I think David, this kind of comes, you know, for us in the schools, we've been working with as part of the EdTech Demonstrator program, a lot you know, similar to the previous question about those breaks, building in those distinct break times for students and time for students to have away from the screen. Um, interestingly, I've seen some fantastic things where uh, teachers will set students a task that they might have to go go away, cook a pasta salad in food tech, for example, something something a bit lighter than than might be the you know the the usual kind of delivery. Brilliant, brilliant. So moving on to the next question, uh, how are you managing staff well-being when delivering live lessons, uh, spending much more time on screen than usual? Yeah, so, and, and again, this is kind of rapid fire, isn't it? I'll, I'll get through a couple more, but I think staff are generally having to spend a lot more time on screen. Um, and, you know, they're not used to it. Teachers are used to teaching in a classroom. So it has been a shift. I think, importantly, the teacher's role here hasn't changed. The teacher is the expert in the room. The teacher is the person facilitating that learning. And staff have been generally really, really, really great at managing to build in that time in lessons for themselves and for and for students and I think it's important that staff understand that if there's a 60 minute live lesson timetable for example that doesn't necessarily mean that an, a member of staff does needs to spend a full 60 minutes on camera in in front of students and and I, I think that can be reflected through school policy as well and that's some of the advice we've given as part of the demonstrator program great that's yeah really I think that's spot on. And, and just to add that all the things that we went through, mental health and apps and things like that, are really good things for staff to do is to have a bit of time to go away and use these apps themselves because then they can make use of them and at the same time be able to teach the learners how to use them. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, how do you communicate with parents to ensure that they're able to support their children with online learning? Yeah, and th this is a big one. And I think this links very closely to engagement, actually. Again, when we've seen um, when we've seen greater engagement with parents, we've seen greater engagement, you know, with their, their children learning. Um, there's, there's some great tools out there and it, it, do it, it does depend on the platform. You know, I know, for example, Google has the Google Guardian type setup, which is which is fantastic, which gives um, parents reports on on what they're doing. And there's a lot of equivalents um, out there. But one thing we found, especially for um, some more disadvantaged students who, um, who, who sometimes don't attend their live lessons, is very, very rapid um, intervention there with a phone call straight home to parents and parents support them on their learning um, to get on there as, as quickly as possible. And it means they're then you know, part of that lesson. 
Um, the other thing we did as a, as a trust is we set up a home learning hub to give advice to parents on how to help their children access the online tools. Because again, this is something entirely new for parents too. And I think there's a level of training required for parents so that they understand their role in that. Brilliant. Um, so um, here's an interesting one. Um, how do you manage a situation where a student feels self-conscious about appearing on screen? I think we all feel a little self-conscious about ourselves when we're on screen, um, but some pupils find it really uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it's, and, I, and I think we've got, it, it does depend on the, on the kind of circumstance behind that, because at the same time, we're trying to encourage our students to be part of that lesson, whether it be you know, in, in a physical classroom or whether it be online. And, and um, part of the kind of advice that we give is, is there are ways to anonymise in, in really, you know, in really, um, in really kind of important cases where it's crucial as student, it's the only way they're going to attend their live lessons. There are ways we can anonymise students on there to make them feel more comfortable in their lesson and to then build up to them being able to fully contribute in the lesson and and you know, be feel proud and be part of the class. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, I think we now come to our final question, which is um, a really important question. I think with the whole sphere of learning that we're we're doing at the moment, which is how do you ensure that teachers and students are safe when teaching in an online environment? So. I think a lot of this starts quite early on in a, in a student's kind of career in school, if you like, that there is in, in all schools that I've seen an ethos of safety when working online. Um, I know that it's, it's built heavily into curriculum all the way from primary school and students have that inherent understanding um, in most cases on how to be safe online. So I guess that's the kind of student side of it and their knowledge and understanding. There's also the staff understanding, and that comes through training and a lot of the kind of training that takes part, um, that makes part of the EdTech Demonstrator program um, will reference this, especially in the case of live lessons. There are some really specific things that teachers can do when they're delivering live lessons to ensure that um, both teachers and students are safe. Um, one of the things that a lot of schools choose to do is record all of their lessons um, even record breakout rooms if TAs are working with students. And there are, the, you know, the, the kind of more technical um, ways of, of protecting students and staff, and that would be things like firewalls and, and things that are built into the devices that students use. And I know that um, a lot of schools choose to, when they, when they give devices to students, they choose to have kind of an overarching policy on the, on the firewall so that students are as safe as they can be when they're online. But I think a lot of this comes from the ethos within a school. Well, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Neil and Tristan. Um, we've covered quite a lot of ground <laughs> in the past uh, half an hour or so. Um, but really important questions um, that are coming up all across the country um, in, as we work with students in an online environment. Um, Neil's given some references to the EdTech Demonstrator Programme, um, which you can follow up uh, for more resources and information. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, hope you found it useful. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks, Tristan. Thank you, both. Thank you, David, Tristan and Neil. I'm Maggie Dennis, and after 20 years of being a primary teacher, I now have the role of pastoral support lead at Danesfield School, and I'd like to give you a bit of an insight into how we've been supporting our children's emotional well-being during this latest period of remote learning. The Department for Education issued guidance last year, which outlined various methods to support the well-being of pupils. One was with regards to having realistic expectations of what each child would and wouldn't be able to do while learning from home. Many of us on our staff team are parents too, and we understand the difficulties of providing screens and space for our children to work, particularly when you have more than one child, coupled with trying to work at the same time. We get it. So the first thing to say here is that we have tried very hard to remove or certainly reduce any pressure on children and their parents. School laptops were loaned to any children who didn't have access to one at home. 
A full time table of daily class calls is available to children via Microsoft Teams, which helps provide some form of continuity of learning, but perhaps more importantly, keeps us connected with our pupils and also allows them an all important opportunity to interact with each other if they can access the live calls. But these calls are recorded and made available for children and their parents to access at a time that suits the whole family. So we took away the pressure of needing to be online at a certain time and we've kept things flexible. Our wonderful forest school leader put together a series of videos giving families ideas of things to do outside with their children. These can be accessed at any time and give parents something else to do with their children. We keep in touch with parents via a weekly newsletter and have made it clear that the online class timetables are there to help provide structure to each child's day, but that if it's felt that a particular afternoon might be best spent walking in the woods, then that is okay. We want to encourage and support parents as they deal with every lockdown day by giving them a structured programme that is realistic as well, given the current times. For us as a school, the provision of learning opportunities is of course a huge priority, but so is making sure our children and their parents are as happy as they can be. We use a computer programme called Skodal with our year five and six children, which gives them an opportunity to think about and share how they're feeling with their teachers in a confidential way. We see this as a kind of early warning system that helps us to identify children who aren't happy. And also it gives us a way to analyse and look at at a glance what the contributing factors are. It might not come as a surprise to you that the most common theme we've seen being identified by children feeling unhappy is that of friendship issues. In school, we deal with this by offering one-to-one -one support, small group work and circle time sessions amongst other things. This is now shifted to an online version I check in with individual children as well as working with small groups. It's so important that children's voices are still heard and we fully agree with the Skodal philosophy that having the opportunity to check in should be a purposeful and deliberate part of every school community. We are well aware of the alarming statistics that indicate half of all adult mental health problems start before the age of 14 and that steps need to therefore be taken early on to identify problems and provide support as quickly as possible. For some time now, we've attempted to normalise conversations about mental health and well-being, and our children have become increasingly fluent in using the language associated with good mental health. We have many pupils who will talk about having a growth mindset in their approach to any problems or difficulties. We too have had to have a growth mindset approach to this current situation. None of us signed up to teaching or supporting our children via computer screens when we entered the profession. But we are able to teach and support children via a computer screen to an extent. The DV guidance referred to maintaining a sense of community for all members of the school family, children, parents, teachers, and the entire staff team. We recognize ourselves as a hub of the local community and that our school is the place where children spend up to half their waking hours. To attempt to replicate this hub virtually isn't easy, but there are things we can do to create an online community. By having Microsoft Teams as our platform for remote learning, we can bring classes of children together as well as smaller groups. Children can see each other during class calls and teachers have also set up a playground channel on their respective class teams, which children can use to chat to each other, share pictures and so on. We're conscious of guiding our children in how to engage effectively and safely with each other online, as well as being able to have fun still together. I've been running some break time sessions, a 15, 20 minute call where I invite maybe four or five children to join me for a break. We have a chat together, we might play a funny game. Seeing children laughing and chatting together like this, even if it's on a screen, gives me as much of an emotional boost, not just them. In school, we run a lunchtime friendship club called Poppy Club. It's always been popular, particularly among the large number of military children who we have on our role. This has been transferred to an online version, which last week was attended by over 40 children from across year groups. This enabled children to see people from outside their own class and you could see the delight on their faces at being able to see each other this way. The technology we have or that we use allows us to share screens and access things like Kahoot quizzes, which our children love taking part in. Staying in contact with each other has been something we've monitored carefully. Teachers are able to see who is and isn't accessing the class calls and they will check up on any children who aren't attending just to see how they're doing. We stay in regular touch with parents by Teams, phone and email. Teachers are asked to let the senior leadership and pastoral team know if someone's struggling or is in need of more support. Letters are signed off with the words Team Danesfield and that's what we encourage our children to think of us as being. 
one big team that supports, encourages, and really roots for each other. Going into children's homes, albeit virtually, and teaching them in this way has of course brought challenges, but lovely moments too. It's lovely to see a child want to show you their dog, or their cat, their teddy bear, their new football, their snowman in the garden. All of this has led to perhaps the strengthening of relationships between children and their teachers, which will be hugely positive for when the return, return to school can happen. Having more frequent calls and video calls has also allowed for the development of strong relationships with families, as communication has perhaps felt a bit less formal than a meeting in school. And this is definitely something to bear in mind for the future, as different styles of communication and channels may continue to offer more opportunities for disclosure and support. So, to summarise our approach to supporting children's wellbeing, no pressure, just support and honesty, opportunities for children to interact with each other as a class and in smaller groups, opportunities for children to express how they're feeling and for that to be monitored. And remembering that these are children and they follow our lead. If we can make this as fun a time as it can be, then that's what they will remember. Last week, we hand wrote notes to all 430 pupils telling them how awesome we thought they were. And we attached these notes to a chocolate bar. These were then hand delivered by members of our incredible staff team to each child's home. We received so many messages from parents saying things like, this is just the boost we needed, or this has really made their day. This concludes the session for now. I'm going to pass you back now to Becky, who'll close the event. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thanks so much to Neil and to all the speakers for their terrific inputs. That's been brilliant. So to sum up, we've had inputs on getting the basics right, on managing complexity of delivery of lessons in and out of the classroom simultaneously, of getting the best out of resources like Oak National Academy and, and others, um, on delivering the curriculum virtually effectively, and maintaining well-being, motivation and those good habits in pupils, and of course, keeping pupils safe. I hope those suggestions have been useful to you and that you'll be able to share and discuss them with colleagues. It's in these collective ways that we can support quality of practice, that quality of practice that, as I said at the beginning, is the most important element in effective remote education, and of course, more important than ever going forwards. Now, I know that you'll likely have a host of questions and that's been anticipated. I'll be chairing a live panel to answer your questions at 4 p.m. on the 3rd of February. You can submit your questions in advance of that via the text box that you'll find at the foot of the event page. So, thanks again for making time to attend this event. Do please submit any questions and return to see them addressed on the 3rd of February. And in the meantime, thanks again to our speakers and my best wishes to all of you and my thanks once again for all that you're doing.